Right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. As you can see from the title, our talk is about um, lessons that we learned from going from proof of concept to production. However, during the, presentation, uh, during the preparation for this talk, we realised there's only one real lesson to learn here, and that is proof of concept does not equal production. It took us quite a while to get our project managers to understand this. But first, before we, what we're actually going to show you are some tips of when we went to proof of concept production. Hopefully, some of them will be relevant to you. So first, though, a quick introduction. My name's El Razia. This is Rob Baines. We're both the lead architects at Haibu Labs. So Haibu, uh, probably one of the best kept secrets of the last year. It's a company name uh, many of you may not have heard of. Here's some of our old commercials that may help fill in the blanks. <laughs> I'm sure we can all remember the lovable J.R. Hartley looking for his copy of Fly Fishing. Uh, James Nesbitt getting his niece a dodgy haircut. You might even remember the revival of the uh, 90s DJ, Davey Lately, who's made up, by the way, just for the record. Yes, we work for Yellow Pages, or in the UK, yellow.com. Uh, we have a presence in the US as Yellow Book, and we have a presence also in Spain and Latin America, so we're a global company. More recently, we're known as Haibu, though. Uh, actually, this month, we've launched a sort of digital marketing campaign to promote the brand. So you may have seen some of these posters on bus stops at train stations. The company is now focusing on uh, offering digital products for small businesses. <coughs> so who are the labs? We're the research and innovation team amongst Haibu. We look at new products and technologies, try them out and see if we can bring them to a, a real sort of mark, uh, product for the market. I guess you're wondering where Twilio fits in on the as after all we're at Twilicom. I'll tell you a little history lesson. One million years BT, that's before Twilio. Uh, yeah, they used to concentrate all their efforts on promoting customers' phone numbers. They would print them in directories, websites, advertising, and let the customers ring them up, but li do little else. We felt that something should change. We're in a digital world now, lots of communication technology. We thought we could add more. This is what the Twilio platform provided us. We could get involved in the phone calls, make the uh, Make the customers be, be better for their businesses and add value. Things like lost calls are no longer lost. They're an opportunity for greater business. With this in mind, we built a proof of concept. We took what the Twilio platform would offer us and built this POC, and we chucked every feature we could think into it. So call directs, international calls, voicemail, call recording, call blacklisting. It was a real showcase of Twilio features. We kept the architecture simple, though. We just we were just writing it to sort of demo it to our business users. So you can see we've, um, we just have a simple web app with an API and a database, and we spun up an instance on Heroku, which is a free cloud provider, sits outside the, the corporate firewall. Um, the benefit of this was not, we didn't uh, consider sort of scalability and reliability at this point, it was merely just to produce this sort of demo sh to showcase to our users. And we de demoed it to the business, and they got the concept, they loved it. One of the real features they liked about this, over and above previous offerings, was the immediacy of the product. We could take a salesman and say, look, we can buy this phone number, we can configure it, and literally in seconds the phone number's ringing. It's a concept they weren't used, used to before. And they said, that's great, let's use it for real. This is where we got a bit nervous. Obviously, we built this POC, works as a demo, but not in the big bad world. So we took a step back, we said, okay, we're going big scale, how do we cope? So what we did is we reduced the features on the product. We reduced the complexi complexity. We want to build something we'd be confident with, it would work on scale. So we honed it down just to the raw essentials. First of all, number purchasing, verification of people's phone numbers, and call diversions, and that was it. Once we're confident with the solution, we started to add more features back in again. So uh, automated SMSs. So you could send uh, a message back to a customer, a personalized message if you're not available. Blacklisting calls, so you could stop calls coming in from numbers you don't want, like dodgy adverts, and allow people to leave voicemail. Finally, we added the sort of rich features like nice call analytics, so the customers can tell where they're getting the calls from, uh, customised views for the customers and our administrators, so we can look at the cost. And uh, sort of summarising the different types of calls you get, missed calls, fail calls, etc. But what do we use to architecture this? As I showed before, the diagram is quite simplistic, built for demo purposes. 
We used many sort of open source tools at our disposal. Some were the same as before, and some we, uh, we sort of changed out for more sort of scalable solutions. Here's the, uh, the diagram. We're not going to go into this in detail. Um, we'll share the slides afterwards. There's a lot of information on there, but we're going to sort of talk through this during the presentation. Essentially, though, we've built this N tier architecture, fairly classical stuff, allowing it to sort of scale horizontally. But what does this new architecture give us? Well, it ticks all the big buzzwords scalable, lots of uptime, reliable, low latency. Essentially, the thing that it gives us is we can take lots and lots of simultaneous phone calls and we get to sleep in our beds at night. We're not getting phone calls at silly times in the morning. So that's what we built. But what about the actual tips from this? Well, when we started doing the POC, there was only a couple of us working on it. But as soon as we went to production, we needed to bring a lot more developers on. Now, the last thing a developer wants to do when they're coming onto your project is to spend a week trying to get the system actually working on their computer, installing MySQL, configuring everything, and just getting it running. So the first thing we'd say is try and automate the development environment. More and more companies are using tools like Puppet to, um, to configure their, their servers by configuration scripts. You can take tools like Vagrant, which allow you to take those same Puppet configuration scripts and apply them to a local virtual box environment. And that way, you know that when you're deploying on your local machine, it's pretty much similar to what you're going to do on the production servers. Talking about that automation, automate the deployment as well. No DevOps wants a 200-step script for releasing their product. So you can streamline your SSH deployment with tools like Fabric, which is a Python script which allows you to make and chain together tasks for deployment of code. So we actually deployed to AWS. So we use Botto, which is a Python library, which allows us to connect, to make tasks, to push out to a dev environment using a one-line deploy, just like you see on the screen. Twilio loves to talk to you, or more likely your services. In fact, for every phone number, you have at least one URL on there. Developers like to be able to debug locally. They like to be able to test their code, see that it works before pushing it out to production servers. However, companies don't like external services talking to you. They don't like to open up their corporate firewalls to allow Twilio to talk to your dev machines. So use tools like Local Tunnel or PageKite to expose your local host out to the internet. That way, you can hook Twilio up to your local environment, and then you can test to see if that call is really working. You want to make the most of your source code repository. When we did the POC, we pretty much did everything on master branch, which isn't exactly the best way to do things. But from production, we really wanted to control those releases and control the features in those releases. So we, brought it, we branched off for each release, and inside that, we branched off for each feature. That way, we can control what gets merged into a release and what we can roll back on. We also use GitHub. GitHub's great because you get pull requests as well. You can open a pull request at the start of your branch. You don't have to just open it at the end. This means that you can get feedback and review from the rest of your team on what you're doing on that feature and makes it a lot more interactive. I think we all know the process, don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great open source libraries out there that can be very useful, especially for POC. When we actually wanted to add voicemail to our system, we managed to get some code, I believe actually from Twilio itself, and it got us up and running very quickly to add that feature. But be careful, because if you dynamically pull dependencies on deployment, and that person who, with that repo decides to take that offline, or they make a breaking change, then that can cause a big problem for you. So, fork it, bring it to your local repository, that way you know that the version you're pulling is, works and is available. Okay, the next uh, challenge you had during this project is there's lots of different ways of expressing phone numbers. I'm sure you, you know, sort of international dial-in, plus four four, drop the zero, leave the zero on, don't use the international code, do we put spaces in, don't we put spaces? Our, our service consumers might give us numbers in different formats. It's a real headache. This is when we found Google Code to the rescue. We found a great library called Lib Phone Number. It's available in different languages. It allows you to not only validate the format of your numbers in a consistent fashion. The best part about this library is there's a client-side version uh, available in JavaScript, so in your front end you can sort of bolt in those sort of rigid rules to make sure your numbers are valid. And you can use exactly the same logic in, in your back end. So if someone's just coming straight into your API without the front end, again, you can be comfortable uh, giving you the numbers in a consistent fashion. Uh, it supports E164, that glorious sort of nice techie industry term. Or any uh, telcos in the room. The next thing we had to do is we're offering this service, people can use their phone numbers on it, but we want to trust them. We don't want people to abuse the service. How do we know that when people register their phone numbers, they really own them? 
So we built in a, a sort of verification step. Don't call us, we'll call you. When you register your phone on the system, we'll give you a unique four-digit four pin number, call them out, and that way we guarantee it's sort of like a two-factor authentication. We prove that's the person. We also built steps into the solution to prevent them registering things like premium rate phone numbers. We didn't want calls being diverted to some 0898 number where it's racking up loads of costs on our behalf. Coming on to cost, we want to keep an eye on how much this was. When you, when you set up a solution with Twilio, you get one master account, but we plan to sort of scale that across hundreds, maybe thousands of customers. How do we keep a lid on those costs? This is where sub accounts are your friend. From the sort of Twilio front end, sub accounts, the availability of sub accounts is always obvious. You can only actually create them through the API, although you can sort of switch through and, and administer them afterwards. So we used the sub accounts so we could create a separate account per customer in our solution. The benefit of this is it allows us to <coughs> partition the application. We can keep a co tight control on the costs on that customer, how much they're spending, how many calls they're making. Also gives us a great way of tying back the Twilio data into our own applications. We sort of hijacked the friendly name ID in sub accounts to tie back our sort of unique <coughs> customer identifiers. So, phone calls are our customers' lifeblood. We should never lose a phone call, even when we're deploying new versions of our code. For us, AWS, with its low balances, makes this very easy. So we use those same fabric tasks. We, for every time we need to push a new version, we will loop through every one of our servers, and we will pull it out of the load balancer. We will update the code. We'll test it privately. When we're happy with it, restart, join, join it back to the load balancer, and carry on with the next one. That way, our customers can keep making their phone calls without any dis disruption. But no system is perfect. Systems do fall, fail over. Amazon has been known to lose regions for small amounts of time. But fortunately, Twilio allows you to set a failover URL for every single phone number. So for us, we actually host a static Lino site separately from our Amazon cluster. This means that even if we lose that whole cluster, we can still keep the calls going through. And when it's back up again, we can sync our logs from Twilio, and we're up and running again. But what about reuse of our system? When we went to production, we were covering one very, we were solving a specific problem for the, for the business and for the business case. However, we are a large company, and we have many projects underway at the moment. So you can be sure that one, of, one or two of them may need telephony or actually need it now. Why should they have to redo this from scratch? So when we built the production version, we built it up from scratch with a RESTful-based interface. This is great for them. It means they can reuse this code but it's also great for us to extend our work as well. <laughs> Hi, the uh, session tracks are just about to begin. There's Ben. I've been looking for Ben, and he's hiding in the cloakroom. OK, so everyone go back into the rooms. The, the content's about to start again. Bye. No, that's the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sorry for the interruption. OK, no worries. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad they found Ben. <laughs> okay, uh, continuing on. So we're, um, we're gradually sort of building the solution, we're adding new features, more and more stuff coming on board. How can we be sure it still works? Test, test, test. I cannot stress how much we should test. I mean, come on, we're all developers, we know this. So, first and foremost, has the logic changed? Hands up who's made that sort of last minute one line fix that's never going to break anything <coughs> with catastrophic failures. <laughs> I'm not pointing out any names in the room, by the way. Uh, unit tests. These are, these, are, these are your sort of something in your armory. Um, we chose to use the Play framework. Uh, it's a Java-based framework with sort of test-driven <coughs> development in mind. Uh, it's influenced quite heavily by other platforms like Ruby on Rails or Django for Python. So it has inbuilt tests, test runners, etc. so you can rapidly iterate the product. But I'm not going to teach you guys to suck eggs on this. Secondly, um, our solution is quite heavily API focused, so we have a, we have a contract with our, with our consumers. We want to make sure that when we make code changes, we're still uh, receiving consistent requests and we're, we're providing uh, consistent responses. We have, we have that contract that we, we need to maintain. This is where we use a tool called SOAP UI. Now, don't be thrown by the name. SOAP UI is a fantastic tool for testing RESTful services and SOAP services if you're unfortunate enough to use them. So. Are they all behaving though? So we've, we've built a web, web app, got it out there on the web, runs on lots of different platforms, lots of different browsers. Unfortunately, they don't, don't all work the same. 
And we used the uh, Selenium UI, which is a sort of browser automation tool. It lets you create scripts to sort of simulate your user traversing the site, making different interactions. Make sure that your JavaScript runs on all the different browsers, even Internet Explorer. So, in the labs environment, it's great. It works, it's fine, super shiny. But is it ready for the big bad world? Our QA teams beg to differ. They want to break the application. So that's where we begin to push the application. We've got an API, we really want to hammer it, push some traffic through, see what the pain points are. So that's where we load test it. And then we test it some more. We, we test it to destruction. Every application is going to fail at some point unless you have infinite infrastructure. <coughs> so this is where we, we look back to uh, Amazon EC2 again. What we did is we used the uh, AWS photo library to script to create a, uh, an instance of an EC2 server that ran our tests. A single server could hit our API with, say, 40 simultaneous requests. Then we'd spin up another one, so we're up to 80, and then gradually more and more. So this way, we could simulate lots of different clients hitting our API from sort of different IP addresses over the net. The uh, interesting fact about these EC2 instances is if you use them and destroy them within 30 minutes on a small instance, you don't pay anything, so it's actually free. What's the benefit of all these load tests, though? Metrics. So not only do, do these tests, we use a tool such as an Apache JMeter that measures the tests as they go. So at the end of all this testing of battering the service, we can work out where it breaks, where we're getting the sort of failure codes. The sort of 200s are great, 400s, 500s, not so good. We can work out how many requests per second, latency. We can pinpoint whether, whether the bottlenecks are. Are we using too much memory? Are we responding too slowly? And that allows us to sort of reactively tune, tune the application. Finally, we want to bring this all together. We want to repeat the process. Again, I'm probably teaching you stuff you already know. Use a CI tool like Jenkins to repeat the process. So all your tests can be set up, and Jenkins can say every time you check your code in, runs the tests again, or at the end of the day. And uh, if the tests fail, it's a brilliant way of pinpointing who broke the code, and I don't know, make, make them wear the dunce's hat or buy the donuts. Finally, testing is great, super call an API, something comes back, but is the phone really ringing? Now, sort of automated tests don't always prove that. But we use a tool called uh, Sip Simple. Uh, looks like Twilio have got some other things in this ballpark they might use in the future, but for now we're using this sort of Python library, um, which allows us to remote control VoIP numbers, allows us to make outgoing phone calls, allows us to receive calls, it even allows us to record the WAV on a call. So if you're traversing an I IVR system, you can actually hear what the customer's going to get depend on your sort of test case. But will this solution actually scale? Our UK mobile web app and mo mobile application generates over 18 million calls a year. How can we be sure that we can cope with this? So when we did the POC, it was a monolith, basically. Everything was in one application, all the parts, which is great for a POC, but when one part runs slow, it all runs slow. So when we came to do the actual production version, we separate the app into key parts, call handling, website, restful service. This means that we can scale just the parts that need it. And if you've got that report that's running slow, it's not going to slow down the performance of your call handling. Talking of calls, a single call actually will, uh, with one divert and a whisper is going to hit your services three times before it actually the caller is connected. So you really want to think about reducing latency. Do you really need to do 14 database calls when you're um, when they're trying to make a phone call? Is the data static? If so, cache it. In our POC, we use memcached. Now we're in production, we've actually gone to Redis. Redis allows us to put a lot more structured objects into there. It also means we can run it in a clustered environment, so all our web servers can use the same cache. Work smarter, not harder. Do you really need to do that logging at that moment in time? If not, push it onto a message queue and with something like RabbitMQ or even Redis itself. That way, you can asynchronously handle those tasks and not affect the call. OK, with big scale comes big cost. So again, we have to keep an eye on the cost. As I mentioned earlier, we decided to host on AWS. But these sort of tips are probably applicable to most cloud providers. Amazon makes it easy to spin up instances. It's almost too easy, click of a button. It costs a fraction of a cent. It looks cheap at first, but when you roll it out to multiple servers, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the cost begin to ramp up. Also, if you go for the sort of gold star solution of multi-zone resilience, again, the costs escalate. 
So I only use the that level of resilience in your production systems, not your development ones. Uh, finally, we also found out that you can save a lot of money by reserving instances up front. If you know which machines you want, you can buy 12 months in advance and almost halve the costs. We also have some twips, twips. We have some <laughs> tips on Twilio pricing. I'm sure the, uh, there'll be some people here today who would happily take your arm off on tiered pricing. The idea is the more you spend, the more you save. So if you commit with Twilio, they'll give you a better discount. And the more we spend with Twilio, the more champagne at next year's Twilicon. So, point at Michael in the front here. <laughs> and just going to recap now on the, the sort of tips we've got. Basically, uh, validate and verify your numbers. Make sure you, they're reliable, and they are who they say they are. Use the sub accounts to partition your cost. You can associate those costs with a particular customer. Keep an eye on your service performance. When you're testing, you really want to know where those pinch points are. I don't need to re repeat the test in Mantra again. And make most of tiered pricing. And automate everything. Automate the development environment if you can. Automate the deployment. It makes it so much easier. Use the tools like Local Tunnel for debugging on your local machine. Branch off your features and get feedback on them early as well with pull requests. Don't reinvent the wheel, but remember to fork the data, fork the code and bring it in locally if you are going to use it. Have a failover plan in place um, just in case you can't, um, just in case the system does go down so you can still get those calls through. Make it restful makes it easier for you to reuse it internally for yourselves and for the rest of the company. Modularize your code, makes it a lot easier to scale just the parts that need it. And minimize the latencies on calls, because those are the things that really matter. Thank you very much. Thank you.